Hello and welcome to this lecture series on the unconscious. I will be focusing on ideas pertaining to the self, the ego, all sorts of concepts that are inspired especially from the analytical psychology of Carl Gustav Jung and I will try and give a more philosophical grounding of what it means to understand the world as a kind of synthesis of the physical world and the psyche rather than merely a separate objective world in which subjectivity is merely a bi a bi phenomenon a sort of epiphenomenon a byproduct something that's explained away and this way we could arrive at a more fundamental more deeper understanding what it means to be immersed in the world what it means to be in the world and I tie this especially to the philosophy of Martin Heidegger, which spoke about Dasein, that kind of primordial sense of being which predates the separation of this kind of sense of being in the world into the split polarity of the subject and the object, of this rift between the inner and the outer world. And so I see that Jung kind of explored a territory which wasn't philosophically um, built up yet, where the foundation wasn't built up, but that foundation was provided for arguably by the phenomenological kind of approach of Martin Heidegger, and especially the kind of attempt to bring together narration and facts, or one could say mythos and logos, um, is important in that kind of philosophy and it is especially important that the poetic is brought back into philosophy and in that way perhaps an opening can be found outside of this merely rational and kind of controllable understanding of the world. Now it is titled A Tale of Light and Shadow as we will see that for an authentic understanding of the world where meaning discloses itself by itself one needs to recognize and leave the world as it is as it conceals itself from oneself so that which is not available that which is not readily disclosed is important to be left as such in order for meaning to spring out of that unknown, out of that kind of concealed um, unconscious aspect, one could say, of the world. One can start understanding these kind of concepts if one thinks about the um, the, the understanding of the unconscious and of the narration as something that originally comes from a sort of mythical or narrational understanding of the world. And by no means does this mean that we can do away or that it is somehow something that is in opposition or in contradiction to the kind of logical rational understanding of the world. But one could say that the logical rational understanding is merely a distinction from something that has voluntarily separated itself from the initial unity. What this means, this may be a bit complicated to understand, but what this means is, for example, as an analogy, if you have a story and you have a narrator, then the narrator undergoes a sort of purposeful distinction in order to create a fictional character. So that character is immersed in a world and purposely that character is concealed from the narrator in order for that character to develop their own kind of dynamic for there to be an actual um, kind of development for there to be an actual kind of um, unfolding of a narrative the character needs to be concealed from the narrator and the narrator at the same time becomes concealed from the character However, it is clear that that distinction is not a polar opposite. So we don't have the character on the one side and the narrator on the other side. We have the narrator that has made that distinction within himself, within the self, to become the individual, 
one can understand this in the way that there is a sense of identity of the narrator that flows into the, the character, but also into the entire world the character is immersed in. So this kind of distinction leads to this sense of being in a world as the distinction leaves up this gap, this gap in which the narrator is concealed from the character and the character from the narrator. And in that kind of distinction, in that kind of gap, the world can disclose new things. The world can unfold a narrative to the character. So one can compare this with, for example, someone dreaming. When you are dreaming, then you meet other people, other characters, and you are in a, an envi environment. And the question is then, who really is you? On the one hand, the character that is kind of moving about this dream is you, but on the other hand, everyone you meet, the entire world around you, is something that yourself also constructs. And it goes to show if one sees the world in a dream as a sort of representation of the world in waking life, then the kind of self seems to be inseparable from a being in a world. And we will see later on in a further episodes that Heideggerian thought talks about this. Heideggerian thought um, locates the origin in which subject and object have split from as this Dasein or the sense of being there or the sense of being in a world. Now, it is important to note, as I just said, that they are not polar opposites. The narrator is not a polar opposite of the character, it is more something that you could call a voluntary split. And this voluntary split that leads to the concealment of those distinct entities from each other, that is where the unconscious is born. That is where the world becomes something that in itself contains something inaccessible. Something that's inaccessible but that may actually disclose itself to the character, but may conceal itself again from the character. And one could say that this may apply, for example, to stories, but it needs to be something separate. It needs to be something only for interpretation of literature, but may not apply for science. However, one shouldn't forget that the world with its, with its colors and its sounds and its smells cannot be imagined without an observer. It has already been shown, for example, in quantum theory, even though there's a lot of spiritual baggage that people like to interpret into quantum theory, uh, we can say as much as that an observation, even philosophically, makes no sense without an observer. In the same way, the kind of so-called objective experience is tailored to a sort of sense of self, and we cannot think it's separate from the subject. So the polarity between subject and object um, is in a sense an artificial one. It is something that arises if one, uh, it, it arises from that distinction between the self and the ego in Jungian psychoanalysis, um, which is nothing else but the separation of the narrator from the character. And this separation if it is not integrated, if it reaches a sort of extreme point, it sees itself in a polar opposition. So one could say the separation from the ego from, of, with the self casts this shadow, which also is an entity in the Jungian psychoanalytic practice. And that shadow takes on an increasingly polar opposite form to the ego, an increasingly radical form, the more the ego kind of strives to um, emphasize that fundamental separation with the narrator, the more it strives to escape it. And that shadow seems to be the force pulling it back. As this reconciliation happens in one way or another with the ego and the shadow, it is important to not have both entities destroy each other and both opposites dissolve, but what is important is integration. The integration of the shadow is an important aspect in the psychoanalysis of Jung. Now, when and how 
do we arrive at that unity? How do we find that point in which the separation hasn't happened yet, in which we haven't separated yet into an objective literary, uh, objective scientific world and a subjective kind of literary world with meaning in it? We arrive there at the point of narration. So a written story is already in the have been, it's already past. And there one can separate it. We can see there's the medium which contains the story, like the book, and then we have the actual sense of the story. There we have it. We have another distinction we got in philosophy, such as matter and spirit. That distinction is also a consequence of the same distinction that is attempted to be reconciled in Heideggerian, uh, Heideggerian thought, right? And this will be talked about later, but we see the same thing happening that there is a separation that seems to be not reconcilable, but that happens only because time has not been taken into account properly. So time is also seen as this separate linear progression, but the initial phenomenological approach to time is that is that event of the reaching and passing from future to present to past or to the have been. And it is in this act of narration that the unity is found in which the story unfolds. One can see that in a lot of like um, religious and biblical understandings of God speaking the world into being or Christ being the word become flesh. And in that sense, you could say that it is in that point in which the character unites with the narrator, in which the character undergoes a form of apotheosis, that this initial unity is found. And you can see that in, in philosophy, for example, ancient philosophy with the Platonists and Neoplatonists, where the union and the contemplation of the one and the idea of the good was seen as the goal of philosophy, was seen as the point of unity. But you also get that in sacrificial prayer or meditation or the heroic act of overcoming evil in a sense. So Schopenhauer was a German philosopher who got to read the translated texts of the Upanishads at his time the spiritual philosophy of the late ancient Hindu period. And he rejoiced when he read them. He actually rejoiced because he said that they talked about exactly what he'd been working on and what he'd been saying all his life. So he saw himself confirmed by ancient knowledge in that sense. And the idea there is that you get a sort of bigger soul and a smaller soul, just like you have the self and the ego. And the bigger soul is Brahma, the smaller soul is Atman. The bigger soul, one could say in uh, Schopenhauer's thought, would be the will, the eternal will that is ineffable, and the smaller soul is the representation. So the re representation is that, let's say, sub-will which domesticates the eternal will to become a form, take on a form in which the smaller will can exert its own power. And this kind of concept of the will to power has been then further elaborated by Nietzsche. Now, it is right here where the depth psychology emerges. It is exactly at this point, because one could see that the kind of sense of self, the fundamental self that Jung talks about, is this will. It is that which is the entirety of the mandala in also um, Asian tradition. And so what you get within that mandala, within that big circle of the self, you get the representation of the self, and that is the ego. And the representation of the self obviously is not capable of grasping the entire object. So you have the big circle and you've got the representation of that big circle in the smaller, you could call it circle or point that is the ego. And that always leaves out certain aspects that always has aspects in the conceptualization 
in the mere act of formalizing the self um, that leads to its negation, that leads to its opposite, that leads to the shadow, to that which Jung calls the shadow. And it is, paradoxically speaking, the entering, the reconciliation with the shadow that leads to the process of what he calls individuation or the integration with the self. So it is this kind of entering the negation, it is the entering of the void which discloses meaning. And one can find that in Heideggerian thought as well, where it is kind of being which is the presupposition for anything to be, so being is not, yet we need to act as if it is. And so you get this kind of entering the void of nothingness, entering the Nietzschean abyss, which allows the disclosure of a fundamentally renewed approach to the world. This can be also interpreted as something like a form of dialectic, a form of reconciliation between the ego and the shadow. And it seems like today's world is approaching a sort of void in the philosophical nihilism of technology. And the entering into that void may be that cultural kind of event in the narration that leads to the apotheosis of the hero, to the rise of the hero with the narrator, to the kind of great integrating process. This was it for the first part and I'll see you in the second part. Mm -hmm.